What's stopping you from becoming a Catholic? Why can't women become priests? Why do Catholics worship Mary? Why do I need to confess my sins to a priest? Where is purgatory in the Bible? I think the Pope has too much authority. What's stopping you? You are called to communion with Dr. David Anders on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Hey everybody, welcome again to Call to Communion here on EWTN. It's the program for our non-Catholic brothers and sisters. If that is you and you've got a question, maybe two questions about the Catholic faith, do give us a call. Our phone number 833-288-EWTN. Lines are open right now. 833-288-3986. If you're listening to us in Jamaica, here is your phone number, 1 and then 205 271 2985. If you're watching us on TV today, the best way for you to contact the show is via email ctc at ewtn.com, ctc at ewtn.com. All right, and we have um, Charles Beery as our producer, Matt Kabinsky as our phone screener, Rich Jesse handling social media for us. If you would like to ask a question via YouTube or Facebook, we're streaming on both those platforms right now, in addition to all of our other great platforms. All you have to do is put your uh, question in the comments box, if you would, and then uh, uh, Rich will see that. He'll shoot it to us here in the studio. Hopefully, we can answer your question on today's program. Again, the phone number, 833-288-EWTN. I'm Tom Price, along with Dr. David Anders. Tom, how are you today? Doing very well. How are you, sir? Oh, I'm doing decent. Thank you. Interesting question here. This is a uh, an objection from Diego. Diego says, I am a Catholic. I attend a public university. I was talking to some Protestant students. They told me that deathbed conversion supports the thesis that we are saved by faith alone. I told them that simply believing propositions is not enough to justify us. What do you think of this? How could I re have responded better? Again, that's from Diego. Yeah, thanks, Diego. I appreciate the question. So the objection... The Protestant objection that a deathbed conversion belies the Catholic doctrine of salvation is a uh, betrays a gross misunderstanding of the Catholic doctrine of salvation. All right, because this is what your Protestant friends are assuming. They believe that Catholics think that in order to be saved, you must go down a checklist of good works and and you know fed the hungry check did that give drink to the thirsty check did that you know went to mass check did that and so the the objection runs like this if if a person could be saved by converting right before you know they breathe their their last they haven't had time to do all those good works that catholics think you need to do to be saved and yet if catholics acknowledge that such a person is saved then they are perforce admitting that you can be saved without good works. So, mm. ha ha, got you Catholics, <laughs> stick it to you. But that simply is to misunderstand the Catholic doctrine of salvation, right? Catholics have never held that you have to perform a checklist in order to be saved. What's at issue between Protestants and Catholics is precisely the meaning of the word justification. What does it mean to be justified? What are the grounds for that justification? How is it that God accepts us as righteous? This is the Catholic position that grace transforms our interior life so that we effectively love God and neighbor. Now, you can do that with literally without moving a muscle because it's a disposition of the soul. Sure. You can love God and neighbor and not move. And But according to the teaching of the Catholic faith, you will, not in a kind of fictitious way, not by imputation, but in reality, have fulfilled the divine command. So consider what St. Paul has to say about this. This is kind of the obverse of that, but he says, if I, if I give all I possess to the poor and I have faith that can move mountains, in other words, I do a lot of sort of physical behaviors, and yet I have not love, I'm nothing. In the end, these three, three, three things remain, faith, hope, and charity, but mm -hmm. the grace of these is love. So mm -hmm. Paul's doctrine is it is love that justifies us, love that unites us to God. That's always been the Catholic position. The Protestant position, it is, it is faith alone that justifies. The Catholic position is that it is charity that justifies, a charity that is worked in our heart when we believe Christ in faith and we receive the gift of grace. It's grace that changes our character. The sure. Protestant position is that you are not accepted by God on account of the charity in your soul, but rather vicariously for the sake of Jesus. 
Mm, okay. And uh, Diego, thanks so much for your question. Here is an email that we received from Patson. Patson says, I have this girl who has been my childhood friend that I like, but she's a Protestant and speaks in tongues, which scares me. She said she gained the spirit of speaking in tongues when she was hungry for it. She went to a pastor who was praying for people to have the gift of speaking in tongues. What can I do? Um, sure. Thanks. I appreciate the question. So the Catholic Church does uh, not frown upon the modern uh, experience of glossolalia, or speaking in tongues. And, and so the charismatic spirituality, which is a, uh, a deliberate pursuit of these charismatic gifts of tongues and prophecy and healings and miracles and so forth, is mm. permissible within the Catholic faith. Now, uh, there is a wider charismatic movement in modern Christianity. It includes modern Pentecostal Protestantism and charismatic Protestantism. And in those denominations, the, uh, the experience of charismatic phenomena is understood differently than it is within the Catholic Church. They have a different theology of the Spirit. They have a different theology of spiritual gifts. But the practice of spiritual gifts is not itself against Catholic teaching. In fact, it is allowed. One of the major differences between Protestant and Catholic ways of looking at this is that in Protestant denominations that do this, it's typically seen as something that's normative, something that if you don't do, there's something essentially deficient in your spirituality. In the Catholic Church, that's never been the case. It's seen as a kind of an extraordinary thing. And, and the normal way of sanctity is through the sacramental life in the Church and the pursuit of the virtues. And if you have these charismatic gifts, well, you know, all, you know that, that can be good for the building up of the body of Christ, but uh -huh. they're hardly essential to Christian spirituality. They tend to be more uh, central to the spirituality of charismatic and Pentecostal Protestants. Uh, so Patson said that this uh, this actually scares him. Is that a normal reaction, do you think? Um, sure. So, so the fact that the Church permits charismatic phenomenon does not obligate you to believe that any particular manifestation is of supernatural origin. So if a Pentecostal person comes up to you and starts speaking in tongues at you, uh -huh. you do not have to conclude that that is the Holy Spirit. Okay. You're not obligated. You, you could conclude that this is a person who's acting a bit odd, and I'd rather not have anything to do with that. That's a legitimate conclusion to draw. Very good. Patson, thanks so much uh, for your email. And if you would like to send us an email for a future show, especially those of you watching on TV today, here's our address, ctc at ewtn.com. In a moment, we're going to talk with Eric in Mankato, Minnesota. We have lines open for you right now at 833-288-EWTN. That's 833 288 3986. It's called a communion with Dr. David Andrews here on EWTN. Do stay with us. It's called a communion here on EWTN. If you're ready now, let's go to the phones at 833-288-EWTN. We're going to begin today with Eric in Mankato, Minnesota, watching us today on YouTube. Hey there, Eric. What's on your mind today, sir? Hey, Tom. I just want to really thank you for um, your patience and your meekness and your humility. It really radiates through the, uh, the airwaves here. And uh Dr. David Anders, you're okay, too. Um, <laughs> How about that? Thank you very much. Um, Appreciate that, Eric. Yeah. No, no, I do. And Dr. David Anders, you know I'm kidding. Um, yes. So here's my question. Um, our blessed Lord, as a divine person on Earth, when he was on Earth, uh, he enjoyed the beatific vision. And as far as I understand it, he enjoyed it also in his humanity, like the, the intellect of his soul. So... <sighs> When it comes to him and his suffering, especially during his passion, would the beatific vision kind of mitigated his suffering? Because I know if I had the beatific vision, I'd be I'd be one happy guy. Um, and then, like with our blessed mother, she did not have the beatific vision. However, she was sinless, so her her, her pain and her suffering was more acute than any other human person. So, but yeah, my, my real question is just, did our blessed Lord's beatific vision mitigate any kind of a suffering that he had uh, on earth? I really appreciate the question. So, and in, in answering this, I am, I am shooting from the hip as a private theologian who's speculating. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, so nothing I say should be taken as magisterial truth. Okay? This is just my 
trying to work this out with you in real time. It seems to me that there are certain kinds of suffering that Jesus absolutely would have been spared. Uh, for example, Christ could not have experienced despair, right? He could not have experienced despair um, uh, because he always knew that he was united to the Father eternally, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and, you know, the, 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 the sin of despair is, is, is just that. It's a sin. It's somebody who presumes that they can't be saved. Now, that, that's a terribly distressing condition, but one that's actually morally culpable, right? Christ wouldn't have suffered that. But there are other forms of suffering that I think Christ would have had uh, in an eminent degree that would not have been possible for other humans, precisely because of his divine nature. So, uh, as I'm sure you know, um, a parent who deeply loves their child is going to suffer empathetically or sympathetically uh, with their child, who, who himself may be suffering, in a way that is distinct from being intellectually aware that there are children on the other side of the globe that have horrific things that happen to them. I mean, mm -hmm. we all hear about these horror stories that, you know, natural yeah. disasters, and we think, well, that's a terrible shame, and I wish that hadn't happened. But we're not exactly cut to the heart by it, right? But if it happened to our own child, then we would suffer exquisitely. Well, precisely because of his, of his divine knowledge and, and the fact that Jesus loves all of humanity more than we could possibly imagine— he could enter into solidarity with the waywardness of the human race and suffer personally because of the sins of the world, meaning that he could have a, sort of a sympathetic suffering for the waywardness of humanity and what it's brought upon itself that you and I could never know. And so that kind of divine empathy, I think, it plays into the conclusion of the church that Jesus suffered more than any man could suffer on the cross, in spite of the fact that he also had the beatific vision in his soul. Okay. Eric, is that helpful for you, sir? It is. Uh, just real quick, Dr. David Anders, uh, is lemon meringue pie your favorite dessert? Oh. Um, this is almost a heretical question. <laughs> <laughs> You're a pecan man. Oh, I know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All the way. <laughs> or, or it's, it's been pecan pie all the way. Although I, I, I freely admit, like sometimes very well-intentioned listeners will send me pecan pies in the mail. I no longer eat them. I mean, yeah. I love them, but I do not actually eat them anymore. It does not does not go with my regime, but I love... I'm sure the radio team would be glad to help out here. Well, we, we've done that before. Yes, we have. You know. Yes, we have. Eric, thanks so much for your call today. That opens up a line for you at 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. Call to communion with Dr. David Anders here on EWTN. Let's go to Vancouver, Washington now, and Nathan listening on the great Modern Day Radio. Hey there, Nathan. What's on your mind today, sir? Yes. Sanders, I've listened to you in the past. I really appreciate your perspective coming from Protestant to Catholicism. I am a Protestant, uh, not, you know, I've, I've done some Catholic interaction and I've done some, some classes with Catholics. I really enjoy that. I'm, uh, my question is about spiritual discernment as far as being a Protestant or a Catholic. Grace is bestowed by the Holy Spirit, in my opinion. So I'm wondering, during daily life as we discern... Is there a difference between Protestant discerning the Spirit and their daily life with activities, the way they think, the way they interact, versus uh, a Catholic who maybe goes through a program? Or, you know, in my opinion, there's different things to be members of Catholics, to be a member, and same with Protestants. But is it really the spirits we're supposed to discern? Is there, are we creating divisions we shouldn't have? That's my question. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, thank you. So, so if I understand the question, regardless of the fact that there are dogmatic differences between Protestants and Catholics, when it gets down to the meat and potatoes of actually living the spiritual life and having to make moral choices, you want to know, in my opinion, are there real substantive differences between the way Protestants and Catholics conduct themselves in the world such that, you know, there's a real moral distinction and if, if I understood you correctly, the way I'll, I'll answer that this way. Uh, undoubtedly, there are people of great holiness in both traditions. And, and I, would, I would be far from saying that because somebody disagreed with me doctrinally on a matter of dogma, that, um, you know, that they couldn't make wise uh, uh, choices or, 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 or virtuous choices. No, I wouldn't, wouldn't say that by, all, by, by any means. Uh -huh. um, however, in my experience, dogmatic differences can affect the way people assess their moral situation, right? And, and, and can lead to 
real substantive differences in moral outcome. So um, uh, let me give you an example. In the Catholic tradition, this is a this is a dogma of the Catholic faith. Mm-hmm. Uh, we think that morality is something that can be discerned by natural reason when you consider the nature of the human person and what tends to human flourishing, qua human, right? And it's th- those conclusions are included in what we call the natural law. And that's something that we share with non-Christian traditions like Stoicism, for example. In fact, the origins of natural law philosophy are in Stoicism, not Catholicism specifically. Many Protestants, not all Protestants, uh, reject the idea of natural law and virtue ethics. And I, I studied with some of these guys, uh, the famous Carl Henry, uh, author of uh, God, Revelation, and Authority, and the founder of Christianity Today, who I had the privilege of having one semester with at Trinity Divinity School back in around 1995, wow. uh, famously decried the idea of natural law and virtue ethics in preference for divine command ethics, the idea that the only way you can know right from wrong is that uh, these, uh, these categories are defined by divine revelation in sacred scripture. Now, uh, if you hold that, there are circumstances in which Protestants and Catholics are going to come to different moral conclusions. One place where I think this is really salient would be the question of marital sexuality. So I remember when I was researching my book, The Catholic Church Saved My Marriage, I I spent some time reading literature from uh, James Dobson's organization, which functioned as like kind of a quasi-magisterium for evangelical Protestants. And I I read advice in there about marital sexuality Mm -hmm. that was diametrically opposite to the advice that the Catholic Church would give to her own people. Mm. And and the difference boiled down to whether or not you believed in a natural law ethic governing human sexuality or whether you held a divine command ethic regarding human sexuality— and, uh, and they came to diametrically opposite conclusions about what the moral good was. And that flowed from dogmatic differences within the two traditions. All right. And uh, Nathan, thank you so much for your call today from Vancouver. It is called to communion here on EWTN. We have a couple of lines open for you at 833-288-EWTN. If you have a question for Dr. David Anders, 833-288-3986. Here is Teresa. hope I'm pronouncing this properly. Downington, Pennsylvania, listening on the great Holy Spirit Radio. Hey, Teresa, what's on your mind today? Hi, I'm so excited. Um, So here's my question. Uh, My dad, 92 years old, I brought him to the hospital for a hospital procedure, and he said to me, you know, I'd really like to go to confession, and he goes once a week. (laughs) I was like, okay, Dad. So I had the nurse bring up. I said, I need a Catholic priest. My dad wants to do confession. So this guy came up, didn't have a collar, And I said, oh, are you a Catholic priest? And he said, well, I'm a Catholic priest also. And I said, what do you mean also? And he said, well, I'm I'm not employed by the Archdiocese of Philadelphia, but I work for the hospital. And they tell me that I can't wear my collar because I have to minister to everybody. I said, okay. So I, you know, said to my dad, when you go in there, ask him some questions, Dad, because I don't know if this guy's the real thing or not. So we went in, and he wasn't there for long because, like I said, he goes every week. He knows the words of absolution and everything. And he said, I think he was the real thing. He told me to say the act of contrition. He said the words of absolution. I think, I, you know, I feel good, so I think that was the real thing. And I, it's just been bothering me. So my two questions are, is there ever really a reason besides safety for a Catholic priest not to wear his collar, number one? And then number two, if this guy wasn't a priest, was you know, because Jesus is the one that is the one that absolves sins. You know, our sins was my dad absolved if this guy wasn't a true Catholic priest. Okay, yeah, thanks. I really appreciate the question. So every Catholic priest uh, belongs to a particular diocese, to a geographical jurisdiction, someplace in the world, and the the technical term for that is called incardination. Um, uh, it is possible for a Catholic priest to exercise his ministry outside of his diocese, but he can only do so lawfully with the permission of the bishop in the diocese to which he's been sent. Okay. And when a bishop gives a priest permission to celebrate the, the, the sacraments in his jurisdiction, mm-hmm. that's called granting him faculties. Okay. okay. So the, it, in the future, if you have questions about this sort of thing, the, the, the question to put to a person is, d- do you have faculties in this diocese 
to hear confessions, mm, yeah. right? And, and you know, a person could always lie to you, but, I mean, if they have faculties, then, then, it's a valid, then it's a valid absolution. So if you want to be absolutely sure, you can, of course, call the diocese and say, hey, there's a guy who represents himself as a Catholic priest running around this hospital. He doesn't wear clerics. Uh, does he have faculties, and this is his name, does he have faculties from our bishop to, mm-hmm. to offer the sacraments? Now, mm-hmm. uh, what, I, what I suspect is the case is that he does. I mean, I don't know this because I don't know the guy, right? And there are people who are pretenders. But based on your description, I think that it's fair to assume that this fellow is a, an ordained Catholic priest who does have faculties from the diocese. And it is true that chaplains in hospitals are employed by the hospital, and many times, uh, whether they're Catholic hospitals or not, they have non-Catholic administrators, and mm-hmm. they, they, you know, they, they're not particularly interested in you know, putting Catholic identity for, forth, and they, they just see the chaplaincy as a kind of humanitarian thing and not sectarian. And I, I, I could believe that a hospital in Pennsylvania would, would require a priest to not wear his clerics. I would, I'd be snarky about that if I were a priest. <laughs> you know, I, I wouldn't like to work under those conditions, but, mm-hmm. I, but, I, but I find them plausible. So the whole story is very plausible to me, mm-hmm. and I imagine he was validly ordained and actually had faculty. But you could always check with the diocese to be sure. Now, as to the second question, what happens if he doesn't have faculties? Or what happens if he's not really an ordained Catholic priest? And he goes through the motions of absolving my father from sin. What happened in that, in that putative sacrament? Well, what happens in that case is that it, you do not have a valid sacrament. If he doesn't have faculties or he's not ordained, you don't have a valid sacrament. Um, and uh, the reason that the church has policies for establishing validity, whether with respect to absolution or any other sacrament, is so that we can have certainty that grace has been offered to us. Yeah. You know, for, so for example, if somebody shows up and says, uh, you know, I'm going to baptize you, and here's a bucket of sand, and I'm going to dump <laughs> it over your head and baptize you in the name of Huey, Dewey, and Louie, mm. right? Well, I mean, that's not what Jesus said to do, okay? So we shouldn't expect some supernatural event. On the other hand, when a penitent approaches, approaches someone they think to be a priest in good faith— and makes an honest examination of conscience, although the sacrament itself is invalid and, and there's no guarantee of grace flowing f- you know, from the ministry in that instance, we, we can't assume that God doesn't somehow supernaturally make up the difference. Now, we don't know that. We don't know that. Mm-hmm. But God in his infinite mercy knows the heart of man. And he would know your father's heart or some other penitent who's in good faith trying to make a genuine confession. And so... We are bound by the law of the sacraments. God himself is not. But absent a valid sacrament, we we don't have that objective certainty that grace has been offered. Okay. And Teresa, thank you so much for your call today. It's called Communion here on EWTN. Quick question from Jared via email. I was just wondering if it's possible for God to communicate to us through dreams. I'm thinking about how some people receive messages from God through near-death experiences. Okay, thanks. So it is, of course, possible for God to communicate through dreams or visions or, or any other kind of way he wants to do it. And, and in sacred scripture, we find all kinds of revelatory dreams. Now, um, that being the case, uh, I am far from concluding that every time I've had a dream, God is speaking to me, mm. right? And I think that would be a very unsafe conclusion to draw. Uh, when it comes to uh, the experiences of near de- uh, near-death experiences, the problem we have empirically with near-death experiences, in my judgment, is that the content of these of these purported revelations often contradict one another. Mm. And so you can find accounts of near-death experiences from lots of different people in lots of different religious traditions. They don't all they don't all fit together and some of them contradict one another. So I'm skeptical about drawing doctrinal conclusions from those purported private revelations. Jared, thanks so much for your email. If you would like to send us an email for a future show, the address is ctc at ewtn.com. In a moment, we'll be talking with Morgan in Binghamton, New York, in New York. Hopefully uh, you as well at 833-288-EWTN. Call to communion here with Dr. David Anders on EWTN. Do stay with us.
Hey, what's stopping you from becoming a Catholic? Let's talk about that here on EWTN's Call to Communion with Dr. David Andrews. A couple phone lines are open right now. Looks like three lines open at 833-288-EWTN. Let's go to Morgan now in Binghamton, New York, listening on the EWTN app. Hey there, uh, Morgan. What's on your mind today, sir? Well, thank you very much for taking my call. Thank you, Dr. Andrews. You're doing a great job. Uh, listen, I'm a recent can- convert. I've uh, been a Christian for 40-some years, and I came into the faith a few years ago. You helped me an awful lot. I appreciate that. Uh, I have a dear friend who's a, another Christian. We've been talking, and found out he doesn't believe in hell anymore. <laughs> and uh, we talked about hell, and it's a hard subject for me to even get my hand around a little bit, but I know what, what the Scriptures teach, and I know what the Church teaches. But how would you answer someone who doesn't believe in hell anymore? Yeah, thanks. I appreciate the question. So... Uh, differently than I used to, uh-huh. right? meaning that I used to spend a lot of time trying to argue for the intrinsic logic of the doctrine of hell, and that it, it that it wasn't as counterintuitive as it seemed, and that you know if you really had a concept of you know, infinite divine justice and infinite divine majesty, then you should be able to rationally conceive of uh, meriting an infinite punishment, et cetera, et cetera. I'm personally I'm less persuaded by those arguments today. Uh, than I used to be, and I'm more inclined to acknowledge that hell is a mystery in much the same way that the dogma of transubstantiation is a mystery, or that the dogma of the Trinity is a mystery, that there's some, there are some dogmas in the Catholic faith that just transcend my rational ability to comprehend, and I, I'm more inclined to see hell in that way. Um, I, I also know that when it comes to the flip side, namely heaven, that the, the language of Scripture to, des- to describe the afterlife is, is largely negative. I mean, you know, St. Paul says, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, it has not entered into the heart of man what God has in store for those who love him. That I really can't grasp what the experience of the beatific vision will be like. It seems to me sensible to conclude that neither can I grasp, genuinely understand what is the, the nature of the suffering of hell. Sure. And that from where I'm standing right now, that the value of the doctrine to me, regardless of my ability to conceptualize it, lies in the existential force that it has in my life to motivate me to acts of virtue and to dissuade me from acts of vice. And when I, when it comes to my neighbor, when it comes to my neighbor, um, I don't want to consign my neighbor to hell. And so I, I maintain a very generous attitude thinking that it is possible that any particular soul be in heaven. And I'm never going to form the conclusion, well, that guy is going to go to hell. I, I don't I don't play that game. I don't do that. With one exception, me. Ah. This guy might go to hell, right? And and I need to take that seriously, and I need to try to avoid that outcome. Now, the, the Church also teaches that grace, the experience of grace right now, is the seed of eternal life begun. Meaning that if my heart and my mind are united to God in love right now, even if my intellect is remote from God and I don't know and I can't see and I don't have the full picture, mm-hmm. that the love that I have for God and neighbor right now is not qualitatively different from the nature of the love that I'll experience in the next life. It's quantitatively different. You know, I'll, I'll have that to an infinite degree in the next life. But the, there's a kind of joy and a peace that comes from knowing God now. And if you can extrapolate from that to infinity, you have some clue about what heaven might be like. And I think we can do the same thing with hell, meaning that in moments of despair and alienation and the kind of self-destructive uh, mode I can fall in when I let my passions and my foolish pride get the best of me, mm. there's a kind of... There's a kind of uh, 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 disintegration of my humanity and my self-respect and my personhood and my relationship to others that is quite frankly hellish yeah. and I have a kind of intimation in my own life now from the experience of sin uh, what that might look like in eternity Morgan thanks so much uh, for your question an excellent question and it's uh, called a communion here on EWTN let's go now to Kate in Marietta Ohio listening on the great St. Paul radio hello Kate what's on your mind today Hello. Um, my question is about the infallibility of the Pope. I um, seem to remember reading at one some place that it, the Pope never actually declares his statements infallible, that it's actually made by a committee of bishops who will then 
you know, decide whether what he has said is infallible or not. And I wondered if that's true, and could you elaborate a little bit more on that? Yeah, that's not true. That That's a, that's really a misunderstanding of what the Church teaches. So um, there, there have been statements by popes in the past that are understood to be infallible, where the pope does not use the word, I now infallibly declare, mm. right? Although he can use that kind of language. Uh-huh. But what the what the Pope can do and what he must do to be understood to be infallible is he must indicate in his formal statement that what he has put forward is he is being put forward as something that is to be believed with divine and supernatural faith by all of the Christian faithful precisely because it is divinely revealed. Now, not that the Pope himself is the subject of revelation. He's not claiming to have received revelation. He is claiming that the thing that he has taught has always been part of Revelation. Mm. You see what I'm saying? So, yeah, like, yeah. if, for example, if if the New Testament reveals that Jesus rose from the dead, and the Pope found it necessary, which he wouldn't do because this has been repeated too many times, but the Pope hypothetically found it necessary to issue an infallible declaration that, yes, Jesus was, in fact, raised from the dead, he would put forth a proposition, because divine revelation teaches that Jesus is raised from the dead, I infallibly declare that all Christians must believe in this as a historical mm-hmm. fact. You see... Um, and that kind of language is 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 always present in the text. Um, there are occasions when the Pope will will make a statement that is, like, say, a hair's breadth short of that. Up to the one-yard line. Yeah, up to the one-yard line. <laughs> and the most conspicuous example would be John Paul II's apostolic letter, Ordinatio Sacerdotalis, on the inadmissibility of of women to sacred ordination, that ordination was reserved to men only. And, uh, and if you go back and read the statement, I haven't got it in front of me right now, but he, he, he uses a lot of that language, but, but, but stops, yeah, like a half inch short, uh-huh. you know, where he makes it clear that this is definitive teaching, um, but, he, but he doesn't actually finally use that language. Uh, so, you know, that's... It's not that a committee of bishops somehow votes on whether or not the Pope's language reaches the infallible threshold or not. Mm. No, that's, a, that, that's a gross misstatement. Okay. And, uh, Kate, thanks so much uh, for checking in from Marietta. Call to communion here on EWTN. Still a couple of lines open for you at 833-288-EWTN. If you have a question for Dr. David Anders, 833-288-3986. Let's go to Mary in Louisiana, listening on the great Catholic community media. Hey there, Mary. What's on your mind today? Hi, Father. Thank you for taking my call. My husband recently passed away a month ago after 52 years of marriage, and he's home with his ashes are at home, and I, because that was his um, wish, and I bless him every day with the holy water from church, and I was wondering if that's okay for me to do that. Yeah, I appreciate the question. That that actually does not follow the church's guidelines on how to care for the cremated remains of a loved one. They they are to be buried or placed in a mausoleum in some sacred place. They're not to be kept at home like that. And uh, you know, if that's a difficulty for you, my recommendation is that you just approach the pastor of your church and explain your situation and say, I, I need help. Um properly disposing of my husband's ashes, and, and please help me, because I want to do what the church says here. Yeah, and a number of churches these days, uh, I have uh, columbariums right That's there right. right there on the, right. on the church grounds, so that, that might be an option. Mary, thank you so much for your call today. If you're looking for something for your home that, uh, you know, that maybe says Easter, but that you can want to have up all year round, let me tell you about something available from EWTN's religious catalog. It is a beautiful Resurrection Victorious. It's a beautiful stained glass design representing Christ's triumph over death. In this, Jesus is shown leaving the tomb, carrying a heavenly victory banner in his left hand. His right hand is raised in a benediction. An angel kneels before him beside the stunned soldier who was guarding the tomb. You can enjoy a celebration of color and light by displaying the design in a window or in front of a lamp or a candle on a desk or or a table. It's fantastic. The play of light changes from the morning light 
to the rosy glow of sunset. This image comes to life as only stained glass can. There's also a chain for hanging and an acrylic stand for tabletop display. These are both included. Uh, overall, the uh, stained glass piece measures six inches wide, 10 inches high, just right for your home. It's available right now at EWTNRC.com. Buy Catholic, shop Catholic, EWTNRC.com. I will bet that if you put in the uh, search box there at uh, EWTNRC.com, if you put in resurrection stained glass, I'll bet you'll see an image of exactly how beautiful it truly is. Call to communion here on EWTN. Chris is watching us on YouTube today. Chris says, could Dr. Andrews please speak to the difference between the Holy Roman Empire and the Catholic Church? A Protestant friend accuses the church as being used in a way to continue the Roman Empire. Well, of course the church was used as a way to continue the Roman Empire. <laughs> What's wrong with that? <laughs> of course it did. All right. East and West. I mean, Byzantium was unambiguously un understood itself to be the continuation, the legitimate continuation of the, of the Roman Empire. Constantine moved the capital of the empire to Byzantium. And when Charlemagne came around and purported to do the same thing in the West, of course, the Byzantines were not too happy about that at all. <laughs> no, thank you very much. They didn't need any Latin emperors running around. Mm -hmm. uh, but absolutely, Charlemagne saw himself unambiguously as, uh, as, uh, as taking on that mantle, and, and he, he clothed it with religious sanction. He saw himself as a kind of new David that was going to go out and expand the borders of Christendom and, and, and uh, promote the gospel in that respect. And so religion and politics were intimately tied together in the reign of Charlemagne. And, uh, and so the whole ideology of Catholicism as well as imperial ideology were, were, were intermixed. Yeah, that's unambiguously the case. And what of it? Yeah. And, and your, your point is, <laughs> right? I mean, and you're telling me that Protestantism and Puritanism and American exceptionalism in a Protestant vein didn't make use of Christian imagery and Christian concepts and Christian political thought, didn't, didn't play in any role in, in the development of our republic either. I mean, that, that's just absurd. I mean, find me a, a, a civilization that doesn't have some kind of religious basis to its official ideology. Mm, yeah. I mean, arguably, even, even Soviet communism uh, which is, you know, deeply uh, atheistic and and, uh, uh, and anti-Christian, is a, is from one respect kind of Christian heresy because it takes Christian eschatology and soteriology, a, you know, a sort of salvific vision of a utopian future, and mm -hmm. translate that into a kind of secular uh, political ideology. But it has, but it has uh, Christian roots. I mean. You know, Marxism is grounded in Hegelianism, and Hegel was absolutely a kind of secularization of, of, uh, of Christian Trinitarian thought. So, I mean, f find me any, uh, any civilization that doesn't have some kind of religious basis to its political ideology. That doesn't mean that these ideologies are true. Yeah. It doesn't mean that these admixtures are always just, far from it. Uh, but that just seems inescapably the way culture develops. Chris's Protestant friend is saying that the church is being used as a way to continue the Roman Empire now. Oh, is he meaning that like the con the, the contemporary Catholic Church right yeah. now? Yes. He's talking about the Holy Roman Empire, right? But if he means like, you know, that the Pope and the bishops and so forth maintain some of the trappings of imperial Rome and, you know, the law and, and, uh, and organizational structure and, you know, the vestments and the architecture and this sort of thing. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, I mean... Should they get their clothes from Macy's? I mean, like, you know what? Yes. And what's the problem with that? There you go. Chris, thanks so much for your question via YouTube today. Here is Terry in Urbana, Illinois, listening on the great Holy Family Radio. Terry, what's on your mind today? Hello. Thank you. I'm looking for kind of a very basic book on the Protestant Reformation, something similar to what John Bergsma did for Bible Basics for Catholics. Is there something that explains the Protestant um, Reformation simply? A book? Um, yeah, gosh, there's there's zillions of them. Legion, <laughs> legion, exactly. <laughs> Um, I mean, there, there, there's so many basic introductions to the Reformation. One hardly knows where to start. Um, uh, I'm trying to think about one written from a Catholic point of view, uh, because my my library of Protestant history, which is vast, is almost entirely written by Protestants. Um, 
so uh, well, I'll just give you some Protestant scholars for right, for right at the beginning. So there's a there's a Oxford historian who is extremely prolific and very popular and easily accessible named Alistair McGrath, who's quite contemporary. He's an Anglican fellow. Um, uh, McGrath has uh, has any number of introductions to the Protestant Reformation and Protestant thought that are you know 250 pages or so. Uh huh. Um, I um. Uh, yeah, so that's a good place to start. Timothy George's book, The Theology of the Reformers. He's a mm -hmm. Baptist theologian. Uh, that's not bad. Okay. Terry, thanks so much for your call from Urbana. It's called a communion here on EWTN. This one may take a minute to unpack. This is uh, an email from Jerry. Could you please summarize the origin and modern evolution of these mainstream U.S. Protestant denominations? Baptists, Methodists, Presbyterians, Lutherans, Episcopalians and Calvinists. Did you get them all? Yeah, I got them. All right. Okay. So uh, one of these does not belong <laughs> all right, to play the Sesame Street game. Yeah. Uh, Calvinist is not a denomination. Okay. All right. Uh, Calvinist is a is a is a is a school of thought. All right. Presbyterian is a denomination that tends to be Calvinist. Okay. All right. But but there are Baptists that claim roots in Calvinism. There are Presbyterians that claim roots in Calvinism. There are Episcopalians that claim roots in Calvinism. Um, Calvinism is a theological school, not a denomination. Okay. Uh, in terms of the origins of these, so Lutheran is the easiest to begin with because um, it takes its origin from, nonetheless, Luther, right? Yeah. None other than Luther. Luther was a Saxon monk in the uh, 15th and early 16th century, ordained as a Catholic priest who had an idiosyncratic theological development um, had a kind of tortured interior life and uh, ultimately came to dissent from Catholic dogma and eventually from Catholic organization and authority, and he started his own church, although he adamantly denied that he started his own church. And he, he saw himself as a reformer uh, within the One Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church, but that's not the way the One Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church viewed him. He was, in fact, excommunicated by Pope Leo X in, uh, in 1520. But uh, and so hence the beginning of Lutheranism. Now, um, uh, contemporaneous with Luther, there was a theologian in Switzerland named Ulrich Zwingli, who was coming to some similar conclusions to Luther, but also some differences from Luther. And he began his own reformist movement in uh, in Zurich. And uh, eventually, that 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 tradition, the tradition that Zwingli started, came to be known as the Reformed tradition, as opposed to the Lutheran tradition. Uh huh. And uh, a generation after Luther, excuse me, yeah, after Luther and Zwingli, uh, born in 1509, there was a young man named John Calvin. He was a Frenchman who uh, immigrated to the city of Geneva in Switzerland and basically became the theological big gun for the Reformed wing of Protestantism. Um, so Reformed, not all Reformed thinkers are Calvinists, but most of them are, right? Calvin was by far the greatest theological influence. Now, from Calvinism... Um, Presbyter uh, the, the Calvinist theological movement spread to Scotland, and when it took root in Scotland, w Scottish Calvinism became the origin of modern Presbyterianism. So um, uh, uh, Episcopalianism um, uh, came from Henry VIII, King Henry VIII, 16th century English monarch, who wanted to remove the English church from the control of the pope, and he basically left mo much of Catholic doctrine unchanged. Uh, he expropriated lands from the church, and he placed himself at the head of the church. Other than that, he kept transubstantiation and most of other Catholic dogma. But after Henry's death, um, at the accession of his son Edward uh, VI to the throne, mm -hmm. his advisors were largely Calvinist. And so the Reformation in England, took, which became known as Episcopalianism in America, uh, took a more Calvinist direction. In, uh, in the early 17th century, there was uh, a Puritan revolution in England and an attempt to impose Calvinism more uniformly upon the entire English church. And uh, from that movement, uh, there was a proposal uh, to put Presbyterianism form as a, forth as a form of the state church. And the, the doctrinal standards and confessions that came out of that came to be known as the Westminster Confession of Faith and the Westminster Standards. And though okay. they were never imposed on the English church, they were proposed, they became kind of the, the standard defining documents for what would ultimately become Presbyterianism in the United States, England, and Scotland, and throughout the world. Um, Methodism was an 18th century movement that split off of the Anglican church. 
uh, its theology is not Calvinist. It is Protestant, but it's not Calvinist. Um, and uh, uh, J- uh, George Whitfield and John Wesley were instrumental, but ultimately Wesley more influential than Whitfield. And it was a revivalist tradition with an emphasis also on social reform and holiness of life. Um, the Baptist Church emerged from a Church of England minister who traveled to um, uh, uh, the Low Countries, to Holland in the 16th, in the early 17th century, uh, encountered the Anabaptist movement, which is something we haven't talked about yet. These were also came out of Zurich, which was they were reacting against Zwingli, mm-hmm. and they mm-hmm. proposed a reformation in which only believers would be baptized, among other things. And they also held to a strict pacifism with regard to warfare and non-involvement of Christians in the state. And uh, though uh, John Smith, who was this young Anglican minister, rejected some Anabaptist doctrines, he was attracted to the idea of believers' baptism. And so the Baptist denomination emerged in 1609 with, uh, with, uh, uh, as the brainchild of this former Anglican named John Smith. So um, obviously Calvinism was implicated in a lot of those developments, um, but not all of them. Okay, very good. Uh, Jerry, thanks so much for your email. David? Good job. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, Wendy is watching us on YouTube today. Wendy says, I am married to a Protestant who says he's a pastor, but uses a Catholic Bible that I gave him as a gift. Any thoughts on this and anything I can do to reach him? Um, Well, it looks like you're doing it. Good start. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, good good on him for using the Catholic Bible. Like, let's keep on doing that, right? And uh, uh, in terms of reaching him, you, you're continuing to live your own faith generously and virtuously mm-hmm. and cheerfully uh, is the best witness you can give him to the truth of the Catholic faith. And, and, uh, and you know, maybe you could run EWTN in the background sometimes or yeah. when you're in the car together. Hey, let's listen to this podcast. And, hey, I wonder what Dr. Anders would say about that. How about giving him a call? You know, I'd be happy to talk to him anytime. Love the way you think. Appreciate that. And uh, Wendy, thanks so much for watching us today on YouTube. Uh, This question here from from Vinicius. I'd like to know your thoughts about MAID, M-A-I-D, medical assistance in dying. Also, what is the teaching in the Catholic Church about it? Lots of people are in high level of pain or who are in hospice waiting to die anytime with different types of medical conditions. They choose a MAID, medical assistance in dying, to end their lives earlier. Are they going to hell or do they have a chance to be saved? Okay, thanks. I appreciate the question. So the teaching of the Church on this is extremely clear. Uh, You are not obligated to do everything possible to prolong your life. However, you are forbidden from trying to kill yourself. Okay. So you you cannot do something with the intent of ending your life, uh, but you are not obligated to do everything to keep you alive. All right. Uh, So um, here, here, let me me give you a concrete illustration that will show you how fine-grained this distinction can be. Um, Let's say someone needs a pacemaker in order to stay alive, all right? Uh, And yet, their odds of staying alive aren't really great, and the pacemaker, you know, might not work, and putting it in could kill them, and it'd be very painful and difficult, and they're only looking at maybe another six months to go anyway. The church says, yeah, you don't have to put in the pacemaker. You can let nature take its course and die. Okay. Let's say you have somebody that's got a pacemaker already functioning, and, uh, and their situation gets worse, and they say, I, I don't want to keep going. Doc, will you turn off my pacemaker? Ah. A Catholic doctor will say no. So he would have no problem with the first. Mm-hmm. I, I'm not going to create a treatment that has a low probability of success and is not proportionate to you know, what we're trying to accomplish. Mm-hmm. That's, that's refraining from doing something. Turning off the pacemaker is an attempt to kill you. Okay. Right. And I actually know a Catholic cardiologist who, who does that all the time. He, he makes that exa- exact distinction. And when the hospital administrators say, hey, we need you to come turn off a pacemaker, he goes, nope, not going to be me. I'm not going to do it. <laughs> Good for him. Yep. Appreciate that. Uh, Vinicius, thank you so much for your email. We'll go out on this one from Tom in York, Pennsylvania. We have established that it's harmful to hold a grudge. How does seeking accountability under the law for a crime a person has committed fit into the concepts of forgiveness and not holding a grudge? Thanks, Tom. Oh, yeah. So desiring justice is entirely different from from holding a grudge. They're just two. They're just two very different categories. Mm. Right. Um, So, uh, yeah, it not wanting justice done is actually a fault. 
Really? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 justice is a good. Justice is a good. And it's a good for the person who suffers justice if he has done wrong, right? It can be an occasion for him to expiate his guilt. Mm. So, I mean, it's, per, it's perfectly loving for me to desire for a criminal to suffer the consequences of his actions. Okay. Well, that's where we're going to leave it. Tom in York, Pennsylvania, thanks so much for your email. Dr. David Anders, thank you, sir. Thanks, Tom. We do this program Monday through Friday on EWTN Radio. You can check us out at 2 p.m. Eastern for our live broadcast or check out the podcast anytime you wish by going to EWTN.com forward slash radio. Now, once you're on the radio homepage, look for the words Podcast Central. When you click on that, you'll see all of the podcasts that we produce, plus uh, some of our wonderful partners and all that. And they're in alphabetical order, so just scroll down till you see Call to Communion. On behalf of our fantastic team here, I'm Tom Price along with Dr. David Andrews. Hey, thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time here on EWTN's Call to Communion. Have a wonderful day and God bless. Mm -hmm.